Back during what many considered to be the golden years of gaming, middle market titles were the industry's lifeblood. I'm sure a lot of you are probably wondering, what on earth is a middle market game? I thought there was only AAA and indie. You may have also heard them being referred to as middle shelf games, mid-tier games, B-grade games, or even AA games. Regardless of the term, middle market games used to fill the void between the two extreme endpoints that the vast majority of developers find themselves in today. These titles usually had a sizable yet sustainable budget where they weren't restricted from being ambitious or experimental, but also wouldn't put the entire studio's life on the line if they failed to meet expectations. Many of the AAA franchises we know today started out in the middle market. Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, Battlefield, Need for Speed, Medal of Honor, rest in peace, and even Dark Souls through its spiritual predecessor. Unfortunately, metal, many middle market developers and publishers went belly up after the 2008 global financial crisis, with more following suit as the years went by. Once the 8th generation of systems launched, middle market games in the Western world had nearly gone extinct, with even the mere concept largely forgotten by the vast majority of both gamers and the gaming press. Even today, as we near the inevitable release of the 9th console generation, there aren't many middle market publishers left. Thankfully though, the constant dedication, effective budgeting, and focus on making straight up good quality games, as opposed to grand genre defining experiences, has caused the remaining middle market publishers to ever so slowly make a comeback. Focus Home Interactive, in particular, has started to gain noticeable traction with good quality middle market releases like Vampire, The Surge, and Six Shards of Darkness. Of course, these games didn't review particularly well and probably made less money than what a single Activision executive gets as a bonus, but have a guess what's either getting a sequel or was at least able to keep the responsible studio afloat. Where am I going with this? Well, recently I finished playing a relatively obscure middle market title called Inversion. It was released in 2012, the last year I can think of where the middle market had a recognisably distinct role in the industry. Many of you have likely never even heard of it, let alone given it a go, which is no surprise seeing as it is reported to only have about 20 to 50,000 owners on Steam, less than 9,000 owners on PSN profiles, and likely a similar amount on Xbox 360. For those of you who do know something about it, what you've most likely heard from review outlets is that it's just Gears of War on a budget that lacks its own identity. Of course, this is no surprise considering both journalists and gaming communities alike have continued to foster an attitude of one game defining a genre and anything else taking inspiration be damned regardless of how good it is. If you ask me, that's one of the contributing factors as to why we don't have anywhere near as many middle market games as we used to, but that's a rant for another video. Anyway, the crux of it is that I think these outlets are wrong, because while there are very noticeable similarities to Gears of War, it has many fundamental differences as well, whilst also being a solid package overall. I truly believe it deserves better treatment, and so today I present to you all my review of Inversion. In Inversion, you players, um, just let me check the instruction manual for a moment. Oh, yeah, remember when we had instruction manuals? Uh, just uh, controls, setup, blah blah. Ah, here. So, you play as a cop named Davis Russell alongside his colleague Leo Delgado. These guys are driving home from work one day when suddenly their hometown of Vanguard City is invaded by a cult like faction known as the Ludadors. At the same time, the city starts falling apart, with strange shifts in gravity occurring sporadically in different places. Clearly realising that some weird shit is going down, they both make their way to Davis' apartment to check his wife and daughter are okay. After fighting their way there, Davis finds his wife bleeding out on the apartment floor and is unable to save her before the roof caves in. With no sign of his daughter, Davis is now determined to find her at all costs, and with Leo on board, they set out on their mission. Now, the reason I made the instruction manual joke earlier on was because I honestly couldn't remember a single person's name throughout my entire experience with the game. While the overall premise is fine, these characters are some of the most boring and uninteresting people I've seen in a shooter. 
except for this ass wipe of a campaign that can go rot in the darkest levels of fucking hell. Oh my god, I've... the voice acting feels so painfully average and monotone, sometimes even to the point of laughter. And it doesn't help that the dialogue is about the most predictable and uninspiring imaginable. That being said, I have suffered through worse. Adding insult to injury is the facial animation quality during cutscenes, which is subpar to put it lightly, even for 2012. Characters' mouths and facial muscles barely move, meaning they often come across as lifeless and lack any kind of emotion. I am fully aware the game was made on a budget, but I think it might have been better if the cutscenes were presented like a comic, similar to Call of Juarez Gunslinger, Infamous, or Shadow Warrior 2013. Or alternatively, have a smaller amount of cutscenes, but have them pre-rendered. Not ideal solutions, I know, but they at least would have been able to be more polished and may have reduced the development time and effort dedicated to animation. As for the narrative itself, it's pretty dull beyond the main premise, but I will say that two of its components impressed me quite a lot. The first is a plot twist that occurs about three quarters of the way through, which I won't spoil, but to put it simply, it makes you question why Vanguard City and the Ludadors even exist. The second is the ending, which I'll discuss towards the end because it pleasantly surprised me, and I believe it deserves special attention. Gameplay in Inversion utilizes many of the stable mechanics of modern cover-based third-person shooters, whilst also featuring the ability to manipulate gravity. Despite a few rough edges, the gameplay experience is solid overall. Let's start with the basics. The core aspect of the gameplay is obviously the shooting, which is mostly sufficient, but unfortunately can sometimes miss the mark. Controlling Davis is fine, and aiming your gun is never a problem, but some of the weapons feel like they lack impact or punch, primarily due to the sound effects. Both the main assault rifle and default sniper are very unremarkable, although thankfully the minigun, shotguns, heavy sniper, grenades, and other late-game weapons are much more satisfying. Blood and Gore is mostly good, with enemy flesh splattering everywhere when scoring headshots, firing a shotgun up close, or tearing them to pieces with the minigun. I will mention, though, that playing on hard difficulty made the enemies excessively bullet-spongy due to increased health, and exacerbated most of the game's flaws. So, before I continue any further, I should mention that I thoroughly recommend playing on easy or normal for the most optimal experience. You've obviously already heard all the comparisons to Gears of War, and I can't exactly claim it's in an inappropriate title for reference. The cover system is borderline identical, but still solid on its own merit. Davis can crouch behind most walls, barriers, pillars, fences, etc., and has the ability to both pop out and aim at targets, or blind fire to minimise exposure to enemy fire. Alongside this, he can vault over certain pieces of cover, as well as switch to other nearby cover if parallel. Most of this works fine, barring one minor flaw with how sometimes you can only peek out from the right-hand side of cover, meaning occasionally you'll have no choice but to expose Davis to enemy fire if trying to aim from the left-hand side. But what really separates Inversion from anything else on the market is, of course, the gravity manipulation abilities. Early on, Davis and Leo are captured by the Ludadors and taken to a makeshift concentration camp, where on their attempted escape, they come across a piece of Ludador technology known as the Gravlink. This allows them to manipulate gravity in various ways through two different modes, low gravity and high gravity. Low gravity lets Davis fire pools of energy at both enemies and certain objects, which results in them floating mid-air temporarily. Alongside this, Davis can charge up a shockwave which does high damage to all enemies around him within melee distance. Later on in the game, the Gravelink is upgraded so that floating objects such as barrels, rocks, cars, and even enemies themselves can be grappled and thrown across the environment. I might as well get this out of the way right now. Grabbing and tossing enemies into the sky will never, ever get old, and it's easily one of the best aspects of inversion. High gravity shares a few of the same attributes as low gravity, such as the shockwave, but there are many differences as well. For one, the gravity pools this time around bring enemies to the ground and can turn them into crushed tomatoes when landing a direct hit. There's also an equipable shield, which blocks all enemy damage while it lasts and becomes almost a necessity in some of the later stages. 
Most gravity modes have limited capacity, however, meaning you can't endlessly spam the Gravelink whenever you feel like it. The game utilizes a good balance, where the Gravelink will always recharge a single shot in case you have run out in the open and need it to progress, but recharging is fairly slow, and so the game encourages you to scour the environment for batteries which replenish your Gravelink energy. On the rare occasion, you can also find larger batteries which will permanently upgrade your Gravelink capacity. So there's a decent incentive for you to explore each level as much as you can. The only clear flaw I notice is that sometimes firing the Gravelink from cover is ineffectual due to shots getting caught on where you're hiding, resulting in multiple times where your energy is needlessly wasted. In the end though, the Gravelink is thoroughly entertaining to mess around with and has great oral and visual effects to boot. It's a shame that these abilities don't feel as integral as they could have been, primarily due to most of the game being playable as a bulk standard cover-based shooter, but even so, they're a worthwhile addition, and in my view, give the game a distinct sense of identity. Outside of the core mechanics is the level design. Inversion features levels that for the, that for the most part are completely linear, although there are a couple of points where you'll be able to go down more than one path. To be honest, there's not really anything wrong with them being there, but I feel they were completely unnecessary as they don't provide any noticeable advantage or change in the way you approach a firefight. Despite this, there are some quite unique and interesting aspects to some of the stages. Occasionally, you'll encounter small energy pools, which when walked into, completely shift the center of gravity, essentially allowing you to walk on walls and ceilings. These make for some truly memorable moments where you are seeing the world literally tilted on its head, whilst engaging enemies that are on a completely different center of gravity. There's also segments where the entire area is in zero gravity, requiring you to leap between floating cover in order to advance. Sometimes firefights can occur during these parts as well, and while generally good, there are a few drawbacks to this. Even though there is the added convenience of being able to reload whilst moving between cover points, occasionally you don't have many to choose from, and because of how slow you move between them, it can result in you constantly being exposed with no reasonable way of avoiding damage. This is especially frustrating later in the game, with melee based swarms of enemies that move very fast and are often hard to distinguish from the surrounding environment. It can also be a bit unclear where you're supposed to be going, due to everything floating around and much of the environment looking quite similar. Thankfully you can always bring up an objective marker in case you become disorientated and you also can chain together leaps, meaning you mo move faster and with some fancy black flips because why not? Considering we're talking about the game's levels, I should probably discuss the graphics, aesthetic and environmental variety. The sequences where gravity alteration come into play look quite impressive, but the rest is a bit of a mix. Sadly, a large portion of the game takes place in grey city buildings. This would be totally fine if it wasn't for the fact that there's a noticeable lack of atmosphere and the overall graphical fidelity does very little to make up for it. It also doesn't help that the music feels aggressively average in that it tries to be serious but doesn't really have any memorable melodies or atmospheric effects which contribute considerably to the overall mood. I think if you could go to a more, few more varied yet appropriate sub areas in the game such as an abandoned shopping mall, game arcade or park it would have been more interesting and would break up some of the repetitive scenery. That being said, later in the game you visit the Ludador homeworld, as well as outer space which both offer a few interesting locales and impressive vistas to look at. And I definitely appreciate the game's relatively gritty edge. Every environment is deliberately depressing and you see how Vanguard City continues to fall apart with every day passing the invasion. Also, Got to give special credit to those loading screens. They look awesome as far as I'm concerned. Overall, Inversion is a serviceable looking game with a decent range of environments, but would benefit greatly from a broader range of locales, sharper graphical fidelity and higher quality atmosphere. Unfortunately though, there's one part of the game that becomes a real shit show and almost made me go with the difficulty. Now, like many other third person shooters, Inversion has boss fights. Most of them here aren't particularly great, but they're decent enough and don't become a drag. This is because they aren't insanely hard or long, and while you have to fight each of them twice, barring the final boss, they at the very least are in completely new environments and are fun enough to the point where it isn't an issue, for me anyway. 
But then there's this guy. This fucking guy. My god, I never want to see him again for as long as I live. This unbearable travesty is known as a slave driver. What he essentially does is convert humans into zombie-like horde enemies that charge at you non-stop, all whilst he has a high gravity shield rendering him invulnerable to all attacks until you defeat his mini slave swarms. Once you defeat one of his swarms, he fires his gravelink, which you must dodge or otherwise you will temporarily collapse and resort to loosely firing at him whilst lying on the ground. Repeat these steps until he runs out of health and hey presto, the bastard is dead. So let's start with what is bad about the boss fight itself. Firstly, slave swarms aren't fun to engage because it's completely impractical to use iron sights at all and the only effective way to combat them is to constantly run around blind firing or use the shockwave. It also really doesn't help that some of the slaves are suicide bombers that can kill you instantly if you fail to take them out from more than 10 feet away. Fighting the slave driver himself also becomes a drag because you have no clear way of chipping away larger amounts of health while he is exposed. As soon as he loses a specific amount, his shield will be restored without fail. At a glance, this all just sounds like a below average boss fight, but at least you don't have to fight him multiple times, right? Right? <laughs> no. Do you know how many times you have to fight this asshole? Not once, not twice, not thrice, but four goddamn times. If it was just the first encounter, I would have been much more lenient. But by the third battle, I truly despise this whole ideal, and each one is harder than the last. Here's two tips to overcome these battles. One, use all the abilities at your disposal, and two, don't play the game on hard difficulty. Even if the game was shorter, it would have been so much better if the latter three encounters were removed entirely. Although, ideally, I would have liked to see another boss type instead to add some more variety. On the technical side of things, Inversion does the job but definitely could use improvement. The game runs at 30 frames per second, although there is very mild stuttering that occurs frequently throughout. This doesn't make it unplayable but certainly detracts from the experience. Additionally, it's a shame that the PS3 port isn't amazing, not only due to the frame rate, but also the mild hitching in the menus, as well as some of the cool backdrops being completely blurred out from limited draw distances. Seeing as we're almost at my final thoughts, I think it's best if I now talk about the ending of the game. If you don't want to hear spoilers, skip to this part of the video. You have been warned in 3, 2, 1. In the beginning, I mentioned that Davis' daughter had gone missing during the invasion and it was the driving force for why he continued to fight the Ludadors. At the conclusion of the final boss fight, Davis falls down a bottomless pit with killed her, I believe his name is pronounced, which is the final boss, and was seemingly never found. Leo mentions in the aftermath that Davis never knew the truth, and it is revealed that he had already found Layla's dead body in Davis's apartment, but refused to tell Davis to ensure he wasn't heartbroken and would stay motivated to fight on. The reason I find it so impressive is because despite not giving a single crap about the story up to that point, I was legitimately taken by complete surprise and ended up thinking over the ending for the next couple of days. Having to contemplate someone sacrificing everything for little more than a lie, a false sense of hope, and never finding out the truth is heartbreaking, even when it happens to the most boring of people. I think this ending shows that sometimes you can find gold buried among all the dirt which can change your entire outlook on the experience up to that point. At the end of the day, Inversion is what I wish a lot more vid modern video games were alike, taking noticeable inspiration from other titles whilst adding their own unique flavour and seeing where new ideas can take them. Yes, the game doesn't look the best. Yes, it doesn't sound the best. Yes, the overall story and characters are dull. And yes, the slave driver can go die in a hole. But is the core combat experience fun? Yep. Are there some cool gravity elements? Sure. Does the game provide a few neat little surprises along the way? You bet. To summarise my final thoughts, I would easily recommend any third person shooter fan to pick up Inversion. It's a title that was given the cold shoulder way too swiftly, and it's criminal just how little it is mentioned in current gaming conversation. 
Just one more thing I should mention. I'm sure some of you are thinking that, considering how few copies in version sold, the developer is likely no longer around and there's no chance of a sequel. Well, you might be pleasantly surprised. While there currently are no hints of a sequel, Saber Interactive, the developer, is still in business to this very day. And while they act more like an indie studio now, they still have made various smaller titles such as World of Warriors and NBA Playgrounds. Just goes to show how full of crap AAA publishers have been for an entire generation when they say how expensive game development has become.